Hey, what's going on? Have you heard about our radio show? That's right, there's a medical marijuana radio show, and I do it for you every Thursday night at 8.30. In fact, the podcast is available ahead of time every week. And uh, you can get it at 420lawoffice.com. Just click 420 Radio Show, and you can download the podcast, and you can subscribe by clicking a button, and it's going to show up in your phone uh, or in your iPod. So be sure to check out 420 Law Office Radio. I think you'll find it's rocking. All right. Hello, Stuart Richland here from 420 Law Office and here on the YouTube channel. Uh, we're in week three of the new federal crackdown, and I thought I would do a little analysis for California patients about what the crackdown might mean for them. So let's say there's a patient, and let's just assume for purposes of this discussion that the patient is a perfectly legitimate medical marijuana patient under the state law of California. They have a chronic or serious condition um, that qualifies them for a physician's recommendation. A doctor has recommended marijuana in writing, and they are a perfectly legitimate patient. They're over 21. Okay, so let's say that that patient now uh, has chosen to join a collective in the past and now is going to decide to try to grow their own medicine. Um, if the patient owns a home, and that's where the patient chooses to grow, the patient's home might be subject to forfeiture under federal rules, which say that property uh, that is used in the creation of uh, a drugs, a drug factory, can be forfeited. Uh, furthermore, of course, by growing marijuana there federally, if he has a gun, uh, that gun will subject him to double penalty felonies uh, as uh, they would be construed as the use or possession of a gun in the commission of a drug crime. So the Second Amendment's out the window for this person, and um, they could lose their property as well as go to jail and be fined enough to make them broke and destroy their life. Uh, that's a pretty heavy thing for just growing a couple marijuana plants that your doctor recommended, don't you think? Let's take another example. Let's say that the person rents. Well, in that case, the landlord is subject to forfeiture, fines, and jail. If the landlord knew or could be proven by the prosecution to have uh, reasonably should have known that marijuana was being grown at the premises. So now the landlord in that instance would bear the loss of the property. The tenant would just have the risk of jail, etc. The tenant patient. Now let's say that the patient has a couple minor children home. Well, child protective services could theoretically come around and uh, remove the most precious and important thing in his whole life to him, his children, based upon the fact that he's a marijuana patient and uh, marijuana might be in some proximity to the children since they're in the same home with marijuana. And what they, by the way, the word marijuana itself is the pejorative term for cannabis sativa and cannabis indica, both of which were part of the medicament and part of the pharmacopoeia in this country before the AMA uh, almost didn't even have a chance to testify that marijuana uh, shouldn't be made illegal. They didn't even realize that marijuana was cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. This was a fraud perpetrated on Congress and on the AMA. And anytime someone really uses the word marijuana, in a sense, they are furthering that fraud. So the proper name cannabis should really be invoked whenever possible. Marijuana is a fictitious word, a derivation of a Spanish word for a loco weed that has nothing to do with cannabis. It was used as part of a scare tactic uh, that also played on racism because people heard the name marijuana and thought of it as a, a Spanish or Mexican word, a scourge from below the south of the border, not realizing that cannabis and hemp had been favorites of our founding fathers and were central to our economy, never under the name marijuana. So that little name change is something I wanted to diverge on. But now let's say that the person uh, has lost their children because of marijuana use. I mean, our founding fathers would roll in their graves to think that someone would lose their right to raise their own children just because they were a patient and using a medicine their doctor had recommended let alone cannabis, a completely benign substance. So now this f 
garden gets grown, and let's say under state law, the person is entitled to have six plants budding. Of course, the Kelly case actually says that a person can have the amount of plants budding that they need for their medical condition, but a good rule of thumb is six budding plants per patient. So uh, let's say that that amount of cannabis is harvested by the patient and dried and then stored in separate baggies. Let's say the person decides to store it in one month or one week or one day quantities for the amount of cannabis that he or she needs. An officer seeing multiple baggies would construe that possession as possession with the intent to sell. So we're going to see a whole nother level of crimes. And now instead of just uh, the uh, cultivation risk, now there's the risk of being charged wrongfully with possession with the intent to distribute, both federally and state, uh, which are very serious crimes. Now let's say that the patient has some leftover trim, which is the leaves and lower buds of a plant that are not quality cannabis buds. And let's say the patient decides to bake that into brownies. Well, let's say the patient puts one ounce of brownies into that batter, and now it becomes two pounds of brownies. Under federal law, that would be considered two pounds of cannabis, because under the carrier rule, all of the cannabis that uh, uh, weight, plus all of the weight of the chocolate and eggs and flour, etc., will be construed as a drug weight. Uh, this would lead to an extraordinary sentence for what was really just an ounce of trim. Or let's say that the grower decides to saute the trim with some oil first. Theoretically, he could be accused of making a concentrate or, or uh, manufacturing a drug, uh, another charge, federally or state. Now, under state law, the right of patients, of course, to consume their cannabis uh, um, by edibles is is uh, protected under the Compassionate Use Act. But what about all of these collectives that sell edibles? Well, most of the edibles are not made in a commissary kitchen. They are not labeled properly. They don't have expiration dates, ingredient lists, uh, calorie and allergy uh, warnings, and all the other things that foodstuffs are supposed to have. And one never knows uh, how the, they were handled. Were they in someone's trunk? Uh, in the hot sun for a period of time and gone rancid, etc. Or are they too strong, too weak? Have they been tested, etc. Uh, with reference to testing, some good uh, folks have attempted to assist the patient community by providing testing services only to have the federal government clamp down on them. That happened in Colorado. Um, although charges weren't brought, equipment was confiscated. So Expensive equipment for grass, gas chromatography uh, can cost upwards of $100,000 uh, to do proper testing for cannabis potency as well as for uh, pesticides and such. So uh, now people, uh, let's say that this fellow doesn't choose to grow marijuana at all. Let's say that he's a former patient. Maybe his mom or dad had cancer and, and marijuana really saved their life and saved them from terrible suffering and such. Uh, and so this person just decides to open up a newspaper and extol the virtues of medical cannabis uh, and take advertising from otherwise licensed, uh, permitted, nonprofit, uh, state defensible entities uh, for advertisements. Now the federal government is saying that those publishers, notwithstanding the First Amendment, uh, may be facing jail or fines or forfeiture because of merely taking advertisements, and that includes the Sacramento Bee and some very major newspapers and other publications. Of course, whether they will be focusing on those publications or the more cannabis-centric publications in an act of potential uh, favoritism or selective enforcement remains to be seen. Uh, now, with reference to activity near schools and on-site consumption, we saw in the recent press conference that those were mentioned expressly, and those are obviously legitimate concerns, uh, even under state law and under common sense. But what not, is not common sense is this whole scheme of criminalizing and demonizing marijuana as a medicine. 
uh, let's be scientific about it. Let's see real evidence that shows real problems from this and not just some more reefer madness. Recently, we saw the Rand Corporation withdrew its pro-cannabis collective um, editorial or report, and it did so under pressure from the city of Los Angeles city attorney's office. In the Soviet Union, uh, uh, Dr. Lysenko created falsified information that was satisfactory to the Politburo. Um, and so Soviet and Russian science was kept way, way back in the area of biology because of these falsified studies that were demanded by the political branches of government dominating over science and logic. So I hope the RAND Corporation does a new study and uh, really shows the terrible costs of not only uh, this overregulation and 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 uh, persecution of marijuana for medicine, but the whole marijuana issue. So that's my invitation and request to the Rand people. Please don't give up on this topic. And as far as you people that are patients, you can see that we are in a quagmire of terrible laws. I hope that you enjoyed this little outline of how complicated it can get. And uh, if you do require a consultation about the law, federal, state, and local, please give me a call. My contact information is at my website, 420lawoffice.com. Take care. Mm -hmm.